Okay, I'm going to take a final attempt at explaining this, these positional encodings. And this is something that one of my students, um, Benjamin van Niekerk, um, used as an analogy to describe positional encodings. And, you know, if, if the other descriptions that I gave didn't make sense, then hopefully this one actually um, clicks in and actually makes sense. So the analogy goes like this, that each pair of dimensions, basically each pair of cosine with sine, encodes a unique position on a clock. Okay, so here we've got a little figure um, of a cosine and a sine, and you can think of that as encoding the position on a clock, which for some reason is a rotating in the counterclockwise um, direction, but that's fine. Now, what you can do with this clock is if you know where you are on the clock, then you will know where you are in the input of your model up to some point, right? Then the clock starts to repeat and then uh, the basically the position encodings, um, which in this case would be two dimensional, then they would actually also start to repeat. Now what I can do is I can add more clocks operating at different frequencies. And if I then have more of these clocks, then I can encode more unique positions by looking at the configurations across the different clock faces. And that's one kind of analogy to explain how these um, like position encoding vectors are constructed. So the idea really is that if I have a positional encoding that has, I don't know, 100 dimensions, then um, you can think of that as encoding. Remember, you've got sine, cosine at some frequency, sine, cosine at some frequency, sine, cosine at some frequency, going down. And what you can think of is you can think of the pair of, um, you've got the, the cosine and you've got the sine here. You can think of the first sine with cosine, you can think of that as one little clock operating here at some frequency. So it's rotating with some speed. And then the second one, you can again think of this sine with this cosine as encoding your second clock operating at a, a different frequency, basically rotating with a different speed for some reason in the counterclockwise and direction. The cool thing is if you have a P1 and a P2 and a P10, then this configuration of clocks will be different and that will tell you basically where you are in your sequence. The clocks will also sometimes have faces that look similar to things that we've seen in the past. You know, so maybe T P15 as some, some of the clocks are similar to what happened in P10. And that allows the model to then include these relative positions if it finds that that is actually um, meaningful. Okay, let me also just like very finally explain the relative position thing again. So let's say we're comparing um, P10 to um, P15. And let's for now think we just have a single clock, just a, a single clock, so just a two-dimensional input vector. Then I'm just going to make this up, but let's just say that P10 is there and P15 is, let's just say it's there. Now to go from P10 to P15, I can apply a rotation matrix, which basically tells me how to rotate the clock. Now, this clock is rotating at the specific frequency. It's, it's one clock, right? And so what's going to happen is at some point, I'm going to reach P30. Now I ask you, this is one clock, it's the same clock, and I ask you what is P35. You know that to go from P10 to P15, you go from here to here. In other words, you know that you need to rotate P10 by this much to get to P15. Now I ask you, what is if this is P30, what does P35 look like? And the answer is you just rotate P35 by the same amount that you rotate at P10, and that result give you P35. That's an intuitive way to understand this principle that if the delta between two positional encodings is the same, then the transformation that you need to apply to go from P10 to, to P15, for instance, is the same as the transformation that you need to apply to go from P30 to P35. Okay, with that, I will stop making an attempt to uh, explain positional encodings to you and to myself. But the crucial thing really is that you're adding something to the bottom of your model, which then allows it to encode um, 
positional information in a way that you don't have if you don't have these things. So because we don't have recurrence, we've lost ordering information. And what we're doing now is we're basically reintroducing that ordering information into our model.